This podcast is sponsored by CSMI, the maker of the Humac Norm Isokinetic System. Purchase a new or refurbished machine, or you can even upgrade an existing system to bring it up to date with all the latest testing and training applications. Please visit csmisolutions.com to view all of their available products, including the Humac Norm Isokinetic System, the Humac Balance Portable Computerized Balance System, and Sportswear Online. CSMI. Better data leads to better results. Looking for a way to improve sport-specific training with your athletes? Then you have to check out BlazePods. BlazePods is a neurocognitive reaction training intervention that can be incorporated into your sessions for patients throughout the treatment spectrum. Visit blazepod.com, enter code EVERYTHINGPT at checkout and save 15% off your order today. Hello, and welcome to the Everything PT Podcast with Matt Taylor and Daniel Bodkin. Please do not consider anything you hear to be medical advice. Just a couple of guys ranting about everything PT. Enjoy the show. Welcome to episode 13 of the Everything PT Podcast. I'm Daniel Bodkin. I'm joined, like always, by my co-host, Matthew Taylor. Matt, what's going on? What's up, Dan? I am, uh, I'm good, buddy. I'm good. Just dealing good. with uh, plumbing woes at the house. So. Yeah. yeah it's good I feel to like be we just uh, we just did this like a couple hours ago. I know, I know. Uh, yeah, <laughs> two days here, man. So it's yeah, good. Sometimes. This is going to be a, a pretty easy but, one, a uh, topic that you and I both... Uh, love to yeah. so i'm excited to get into it so tonight um, i'm actually very excited about this episode we're in, we're joined by connor lyons connor what's going on what's going on fellas <laughs> all right so <laughs> connor you and i were in the athletic training program at usf um yeah. uh we both had a buddy ali Danani. he played yeah. hockey so i used to always go and watch him play um even in you know before we got to athletic training but then kind of met you uh, as well, then I've I've kind of kept up with you over the years, mainly through social media, and you've been blowing me away with a lot of your content. Um, so you're the owner of Lions Den in Tampa. Um, you have a podcast, the Ten Minutes Strength uh, Pod, and I was listening to some of that, and you just you blow me away with some of the stuff you're talking about. Oh, yeah. Um, you your your freaking resume is ridiculous. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about you and how you've gotten to this point in your career. Yeah. So, um, like I've been very fortunate in my career. Um, I've been put in front of a lot of, uh, a, a lot of people who, you know, really kind of helped me gain a better understanding of a lot of things from my first internship. That was a complete accident. I was right place, right time at a place called the athletes compound working for a guy named Jason Riley. Um, back in the day we had guys, he was Eugene Parker. I don't know if you remember him that the agent, he was like Deion Sanders mm -hmm. agent. So he was his, his guy. Um, so we got a ton of combine prep. He worked with guys, uh, Derek Jeter. Um, we had Carlos Quinton, Ryan Zimmerman, Tyler Clippard, like big name MLB guys. And that was, I was getting uh, observation hours so I could apply into the athletic training program and they needed a strength coach uh, intern. And they just asked me and I was like, sure, let's go. Um, then went through a uh, USF's program and athletic training, always had the intent of going on yeah. to be a strength coach. Yeah. Yeah. Even wearing the gear. <laughs> always had the intent nice of being touch. a strength coach. That was what I wanted to do, but I thought <clears throat> there was twofold for me. Um, one, I had never played sports outside of hockey at a high level, so I didn't understand the sports and I knew going into athletic training and having uh, clinical rotations, I would get to be around sports and see how practice functions, how games function, uh, what kind of injuries were pretty typical um, so that I would have a better understanding of what needed to be done in the gym in order to combat those things. Uh, <clears throat> you know, graduated, oh, sorry. And then uh, the second reason I thought athletic training would be better, again, was to, to have a better understanding of anatomy. I mean, we had like 30 hours of anatomy and athletic training. And that was in addition to A&P one and two, right? So that's where upper extremity, lower extremity, 
Uh, we had measurement techniques, you know, like there was so we had cadaver yeah. lab, like it was it, to have that. The like. <laughs> USF's program was insane. It was the first program in the country to be within the college of or, yep, uh, yep. medicine under orthopedics. Yep. So it was an, it was uh, definitely ahead of its time. It's still kind of pushing boundaries too. And what it's, Oh doing. yeah. Yeah. You know, and we had uh, guys like uh, Dr. Del Rossi and all the stuff he was doing with concussions and they hired Dr. Lopez, everything they were doing with hydration up at yeah. UConn. You know, we got exposed to so many cool things that I just didn't think that I'd be able to see as an exercise science major. Mm -hmm. I always thought if I went exercise science, <clears throat> I'd miss out on a lot of things. But the things that I thought I would miss out on if I went athletic training, mm -hmm. I could probably read in a book and figure out, right? Or I could get on the floor and coach and figure a lot of that stuff mm -hmm. out. So athletic training, it was, um, got out of school, ended up at a place uh, called Athletic Edge down in uh, Sarasota, Lakewood Ranch area. I was there for a year before the Athletes Compound, which is where I interned the first time. Had a position open up, uh, brought us in. Again, got to work with, uh, like, John Isner was one of our guys. We got to see him go from being, like, number 300 in the world up to, like, number nine. Um, you know, that was cool. cool. Especially, like, one of the coolest things, obviously, was outside of the fact that he's, like, 6'11", right, <laughs> was that he uh, – he had that that game at Wimbledon or that match rather that went three days long. I think the final set was like 78 to 76 or something like it was stupid. And so, wow. you know, that was cool being around that. And, you know, you get to hang your hat on that. Did we have an impact on him being able to play for three days? I don't know, maybe. Right. But he was just a freak athlete. Um, got done at the athletes compound a couple years later. Uh, you know, the <clears throat> new NFL CBA came up and we lost. We lost probably quarter million dollars worth of income like that. And so they, yeah, <laughs> they, uh, <clears throat> they went a different direction, fired the director, everybody got canned. So we were all looking for new jobs, ended up being a director of uh, uh, strength and conditioning at a facility called Athlete or ugh, Advent Health Center Ice. Uh, it's a five sheet hockey facility here in Florida. It is the largest indoor ice sports facility South of New York state. Um, mm -hmm. So I did that uh, for four, almost five years. During my time there, I got to be with the uh, USA Women's National Program. Um, I was a strength coach alongside um, Andrea Huddy, um, Jimmy Radcliffe, Vern Gambetta, um, working with the Olympic team in 2017 into 18. You know, won a bunch of world championships, won a gold medal. Um, you know, I, I've been just very, very blessed to be. Did you get a, a gold lot medal? Of times in the right place at the right time. What? Did you get, sorry to interrupt you. Um, no, you're did good. you get a gold medal for that? No, nah, so coaches don't oh, get them. No. Dang it. <laughs> I sorry, got dude, a, that would have been really cool. I got a world championship gold medal and I got a four okay. nations Cup gold medal, but the Olympic ones, I got to touch mm -hmm. one, but I didn't get one. <laughs> Still very cool. So I got a real quick question. I was doing some homework on you, some reading, Connor. I saw that you're an athletic trainer, ATC. You have the CSCS, uh, as do I. I think it's a really good certification. You also uh, through the NSCA, a performance enhancement specialist. So I went through uh, the NASM. NASM. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, all good. So, all good. so how I read that one is you help people take performance performance enhancing drugs. Is that all right? All the time. All the yeah. time. Yeah. Just me. <laughs> very, very good at that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. So tell me, can you tell me a little bit about the performance enhancement specialist? Because I don't know much about that hey, you, uh, credential a little bit. Like, can I like be candid about it? Like completely? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's what we do. It's dumb. Stupid. It's dumb. So what they, <laughs> they don't even classify it as a, uh, it's not really a certification. They call it a specialization, right? So you don't need to even have a degree to carry that. Um, it's technically not enough for you to get a job somewhere or it's not supposed mm -hmm. to be right. enough. That's not like the intent of it. Um, but it goes over NASM's, uh, what they call OPT model, um, optimal performance training model. I believe that's their periodization model. And it, mm -hmm. it scales down to uh, like nothing. Right. So <clears throat> the, the way they, they work it is you work in blocks, you start off, uh, body weight movements, reclaiming positions, but they want you to stay there for like three, four months. Right. And I just, you can't, you can't do that. Right. There's, there's no shot that you're a, if you're in the private sector that you're going to keep a client doing that kind of thing. And if you're, you know, on the professional side or college side, there's no shot you're going to keep your job. Um, mm. It's just not, you're not stimulating the athlete enough. Um, I took that exam. I finished it in about 35 minutes and it was online. So yeah. and I took okay. it from my laptop. 
So if that enough, <laughs> enough said, but you have the CSCS, which is, I mean, uh, you know, the leader in the strength conditioning yep. world yeah, yeah. as far as that goes. So, yep. yeah, CSCS cool. is a great, uh, it's a great <clears throat> certification. Um, I would say in my opinion, uh, have you ever heard of this CSCCA? No. Um, so that's like oh, yeah. the other gold standard it's collegiate strength and conditioning. Down. Like, uh, you have to actually spend time, uh, with a mentor for like six months to even be able to sit for like that it. exam. And there's a practical application to it. So it, it's not practical in the sense that you're lifting or coaching or anything, mm -hmm. but you have to create a program like a, like a year long program and you mm -hmm. have to defend it. So you just, you don't just like create this program. You have to sit in front of people and defend why you're doing certain things. Wow. And I think that's like, if the NSCA could eventually end up that route, like I would love that. That'd but, be great. You know, here we are. It's just the NSCA. I'm not a fan of the NSCA either, if I can be mm -hmm. completely honest. <laughs> yeah. I feel yeah. like they don't do anything for the money we give them. Um, it, it just, I'm not a fan. Uh, I would like to see more consumer education. You know, you've got... The vast majority of people don't know what a strength and conditioning coach is, right? Athletic training has the same issue, right? Mm -hmm. People think that an athletic trainer is a personal trainer, right? And they're, it's totally different worlds. And same with the strength coach, you know? And so, and, and you know, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I, it, I, I'm not a big fan of the governing bodies. I feel like they don't do enough for us as an industry. <laughs> However, I understand why they're there. Um, but you would think, you know, with them being the national strength and conditioning association that they would probably try to do a little bit more than mm -hmm. put a coaches conference in Vegas every year. Yeah. So <laughs> tell me about lions Den. Hmm. So we're a, a, about a 2200 square foot, like boutique size gym. Um, not huge, uh, but we've got five racks. We actually have four racks and a monolith. Um, I haven't used oh, the man. monolith yet. I just always wanted one and I got to build out my own gym. So we bought a monolith. <laughs> Uh, wow. We've got a turf space. Um, racks are pretty versatile. We have uh, jammer arms. We have uh, 30 different kinds of barbells. Um, so we don't just have power bars. We have cambered bars. We have safety squat bars. We have hex bars. We have Swiss bars. We have Swiss cambered bars. We wow. have... Uh, oh, I'm going to start Googling. I don't, I, don't, yeah. I don't know what some of the... I feel embarrassed. I don't know what some <laughs> of those bars are. Swiss cambered bar, huh? Yeah, so it's a... Uh, like, a, you ever seen a football bar before? Gosh, no, it's like, like a, a bench, buffalo bar. It's like a no, so it's like a bench press bar, but it's got like the neutral grip handles. Oh yeah, yes. Uh, yes so yes, it's yes. like that, but it's cambered two inches right in the middle uh, where it would go down on your chest, right? So you can either okay. flip it and use it like you would wow. uh, like a board press, or if you flip it the other way and the camber sits high, mm -hmm. then you actually can get more range of motion in the Interesting. movement. So it's it's I a buy bar. One. It's neat. Yeah, no, they're uh. Wow. <laughs> well, it, Elite FTS makes a great bar, so they're uh, they're relatively inexpensive. I think you can get them for like under two fifty. So you know, if you're talking about that's longevity awesome. of using it, that's really not that bad. So. so, Connor, we have we have a big issue, and we recently had two big names in the the rehab world, uh, George Davies and Eric Maida. And one of the things that they both said, and this is very true, is that PTs suck at um, exercise, right? And even some athletic trainers, they they also don't understand how to train athletes for that actually return to sport. Um, right. We're great at, you know, getting them through those first few phases, getting them back to regular activity. But then at that point, we're usually, you know, handing them off to their school athletic trainer, if they have one, right. or, you know, we're sending them to a gym, <laughs> you know, let's take an ACL five months out, they're discharged. And we are like, okay, this is what you need to do. Right. And, uh, you know, sometimes they'll get a personal trainer, which I don't know if that's even a good thing. How can PTs, and we're going to get into your fundamentals uh, next, but how can PTs learn what they need to do um, to get their athletes from, you know, month five ACL all the way back to that month nine, month 12, actually on the field? Right. Uh, so I think uh, both fields, right? So you get a lot of strength and conditioning coaches who get these kids at five months and are lost as to what to do. I mean, I've been in facilities where it turned into – all right, well, we're just going to, you know, work the one side and hope, you know, crossover education does its job, um, which isn't necessarily the best thing. It's not a terrible thing, but it's not the best thing. 
Um, <clears throat> I think spending more time around like qualified strength and conditioning coaches would be like a great start, right? If you're at a facility and you have access to these strength coaches, or you've got like a colleague who's a strength and conditioning coach, like you guys can learn from each other, spend time around that strength coach, have them teach you how to do movements, have them give you an understanding of like the adaptations and how to achieve them. Right. So you guys do a lot with <clears throat> like, I guess you could call it, uh, like acute, like inflammatory responses mm -hmm. and stuff. Right. And dealing with that and managing that. <clears throat> Whereas an after a strength and conditioning coach is more kind of trying to create those acute inflammatory responses. Um, <clears throat> but you know, spend time with them, get on the floor, you know, spend time uh, learning from them, have them coach you, right. There's nothing wrong with you going to, you know, not everybody has the funds to do it, but like paying a strength coach to be like, mm -hmm. Hey, like I want to be your client for, a month right and yeah have them take you through idea. some stuff or even like you guys could could trade right like let's say you do dry needling or you know like you've got some things that you can do i i'll tell you there's not a strength coach on the planet that couldn't use some soft tissue work right you guys could exchange oh, you know services and stuff um but finding the right one and and spending time on the floor with them mm -hmm learning these movements and learning like why we do them and you know for instance like this isn't like a like a it's not a it's what i'm looking for like earth shattering right but in return to play protocols like in incorporating <clears throat> somebody who can't deadlift right not going to be able to deadlift necessarily depending on what the issue is like they can probably you know utilize a hex bar deadlift from some blocks and just mm -hmm. get in a good position maybe we can't go through the full range of motion we can do a reverse lunge, right? So there's stu EMG studies that show the reverse lunge activates more posterior chain fibers than even the deadlift, mm -hmm. right? So we can get them on one leg. We can activate, you know, and utilize more gluten hamstring fibers, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> you know, and, and again, you know, I don't be completely honest. I don't remember where I was going with that, but, <laughs> but, you know, now, like, are there uh, any online, any, anybody that, they could at least look up and follow online or any courses that they can at least get the, the didactic side of what to accomplish. Yeah. I mean, you could take and get your CSCS, um, mm -hmm. you know, for starters. And, and to be completely honest, if you were a strength coach, according to that book, you'd be a very poor one. Right. But what that'll do is at least give you the understanding of like how to achieve these, if, you know, physiological adaptations. Um, getting a, just a, a little bit of knowledge and understanding of what the movements are, how to progress them. Right. We progress like very similar to how you guys do, mm -hmm. right. It's a progressive overload. Um, the only difference is like our loads end up being substantially higher than the loads that you guys use. Right. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're talking about squatting, benching, deadlifting, lunging, you know, all that kind of stuff. You guys are more so after maybe trying to get the VMO back or trying to, mm -hmm. you know, like gain full extension and, and gain strength at those end ranges, it's the same, it's the same game. It's just different, different movements. Uh, there's no one as far as following somebody right now. I don't know that anybody's doing it, uh, that well. I am actually in the process with a business partner, putting something together called, uh, we just bought the domain last week, uh, the strength coach Institute. And what we're going to be doing is putting, it's actually going to be geared towards, uh, like college kids in college that are interning and possibly GAing mm -hmm. and giving them like just a, a good, education on all the stuff that you didn't learn in school right so as a strength coach coming out of school if you're going into a, a setting like have an understanding of what like lower cross syndrome is mm -hmm. you know what i mean like because all your athletes are going to have it <laughs> so like have an understanding of these things and you know if, if i don't know like i said i don't think there's anybody doing it right now yeah but Somebody should. <laughs> so Connor, let me jump in for a second. So yep. you just drop more knowledge about strength conditioning and about two minutes than right. most typical PTs yeah. know right now. Daniel referred to a study as in 2021 that I think it was like less than 60% of therapists couldn't pass a basic strength conditioning um, assessment, which is terrifying, right? Yeah. Because that's why we have barbells and dumbbells and isokinetic machine and plate loaded leg presses and hack squat because like we try to combine strength and conditioning and therapy here yeah. because where does one stop and the other yeah. start? I don't really know. And Daniel, yeah. you know, that's your, that's your uh, bread and butter there too, Daniel. You kind of specialize in, in that little field too. Hey, all you rehab specialists out there. Do you have an isokinetic dynamometer just sitting around your clinic not being used? 
Little known fact, isokinetic machines that aren't used regularly are at higher risk for bouts of sadness. Help your machine out and take CSMI's newest CEU course, Isokinetics 101 Online, created by me, Daniel Bodkin, and learn how to use all the exercise and testing applications available on your machine. With new and exciting rehab techniques in your toolbox, your sad isokinetic machine can become an active member of the rehab team again and regain its happiness. Isokinetics 101 Online by CSMI has been approved for eight credit hours for athletic trainers, physical therapists, and physical therapy assistants. Contact your state board for details on specific requirements. This course is available at humacnorm.com slash courses slash isokinetics 101. Connor, what are some of the fundamentals, just the basics that, you know, we should have, let's say my, I'm in my last month of, with my ACL athlete. Yep. I know I'm going to hand them off to you. What will you have or what would you want me to have uh, accomplished with them? before what are some of those fundamentals they need so like uh so the the things i kind of i wrote down a few um so i like really focused on increasing strength at those end ranges right because that's something that you guys can do with like not you can do isometric holds right and we can we can strengthen those end ranges and it's not going to kill the athlete it's not going to put them like in a in a bad position it's you're not you're not going to re-hurt them right so increasing those strength at those end ranges so that when we get them they can squat to depth right they can do a push-up without losing position they can lunge without their foot falling flat and internally rotating the hip right uh those that's a big one um increasing tissue resiliency right again being stronger we get these athletes the first thing i want to do with these kids when i get them is have them jump. Right. And I just, I got to pray to God that they know how to land again. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So even landing mechanics, you can take a, uh, like a little six inch box, have them step off the box and land in a good position. Right. Um, another one, you could have them be up on their toes, right? So you can't really see me right now, but I get up on my toes and I can come off the ground a mm-hmm. little bit. I'm coming this far off the ground, but I can land in a good position. Um, working on landing mechanics would definitely help move the needle and put them in a better position before they get in our hands. Um, you know, uh, so you got not really something that you guys can do, but starting to focus on uh, speed of movement a little bit, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? <clears throat> um, you know, so that they're in a better position, their work capacity being high enough is another great one. If you guys can, you know, if that's something that you guys can do, and I don't know why, right? Like we're, why, we're really why good at going to 10 reps. Why don't, <laughs> why don't <laughs> physical times therapy clinics have, have turf? You know what I mean? Like why? Like it could, it could be something like you guys could have these athletes like dragging and pushing sleds, mm-hmm. you could have them rolling sleds. Right. And that's that laying that foundation for that work capacity of, I had a kid, so he's back this poor kid. <laughs> Actually he was here from six to seven. So he's had two MCL tears. He's had an ACL tear. He has fractured his patella. And he has uh, dislocated his patella four or five times. So he's just back from his third surgery to have uh, his, I guess that they're locking down the retinaculum to keep the, uh, the patella in place. And this poor kid, like, I mean, it's, we can't get through an AD warm up without him doubling over. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so like his, his tissue is where it needs to be, but he is so far behind the eight ball that like, there's no shot this kid can jump into a big group and be able to flourish in any way, right? He's going to need a lot of hand-holding. But, like, you guys, you know, it, even a bike, right? You could throw him on the bike, um, short sprints. Um, I mean, those are those are the big things. I think these athletes are so deconditioned by the time they get to us, and this is just me ranting. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but it would – having them uh, in a little bit better of a place as far as, you know, th- their mobility and their, in- mm-hmm. and their conditioning would go a long way. You also talk a lot about the, the basic human movement patterns. Right. And then, I mean, that, that's huge. Can you tell us a little bit about that right there? Because a lot of PTs don't know yeah. what the movement patterns are. Really? That's yeah. surprising to me. Well, I they, they like- know it because um, they work them through a lot of these exercises, but they don't right. realize, oh, I'm working on, you know, this pattern or this right. pattern. So they know it, but they don't, they haven't had it spelled out in a way that. Okay. Does. Yeah. And so it kind of to, to piggyback on, you know, the things that we just said, having them go through these movement patterns so that when they get in the gym, we can start to somewhat load them. Right. So we're not starting from scratch. We're starting from, all right, well, you've been at least lunging uh, in whatever direction you are, right. Reverse lunges. I'm not a big fan of front lunges. It's just, there's a lot of sheer force in the knee with those. 
lateral lunges, even drop step lunges, 45 degree lunges. Another one I'm not a really big fan of. Um, have them push and pull, right? Staying in position when they pull. I can't tell you. I probably can. You guys see it all the time, I'm sure. You have these athletes that don't know how to pull. Like they, they cannot do like an inverted row without like just completely breaking out of position, right? So being able to pull, being able to push, I mean, uh, this is another thing that I, I think a lot of people struggle with. A push-up is not the best exercise for a beginner. It just isn't, right? A lot of kids don't have the strength to be able to do them, for one. For two, it is not rate-limiting in any way, shape, or form, right? If you don't have your eyes on that kid, let's say you got 20 kids doing push-ups, there's three of them, like, in this position, by the time they get to the end of it, they're all protracting when they get to the top. None of them can maintain a position. I still contend that the push up is by far one of the worst exercises for young kids because they just don't know how to do them. Um, all right, so we got lunge, push, pull, um, squat patterns, right? Even doing something like an infant squat um, or um, teaching them how to sumo squat, right? It's more of a kind of a hinge squat uh, mm -hmm. hybrid. Um, hinging is another good one. I get kids fresh out of, uh, you know, ACL, um, rehab, right. And they don't know how to hinge. Like that should be part of, you know what I mean? Like that should RDLs, be RDLs, baby. Protocol. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> um, easy one early on in the rehab that yeah. I, I love to load. It's posterior it loads the, the knee a little bit, yep. loves the hamstring though. So I'm with mm -hmm. you. Yep. Teaching them how to hinge. Uh, let's, uh, so we got push, pull, lunge, squat, hinge, uh, gate, right? So yeah. I'm not overly concerned with how the kids, you know, walk, um, but like accelerating, right? Acceleration mechanics, that's not really in y'all's wheelhouse. And I don't know that it should be, um, but <clears throat> that's another one. Um, what's this? There's seven, right? What's the last? Oh, rotation. Okay. Uh, so you twist. Um, again, that's probably something that, like I'm not even big in the rotation stuff. I... I don't get often kids with a training age high enough that it's beneficial for them to go through rotational movements. Uh, who was it? I think it was Charles Poliquin. You, you heard of him at all? No. Uh, a, straight, he wrote the Poliquin principles like 30 years ago. Uh, he just passed a couple years back, but he was a very smart guy. He talked about how you can't fire a cannon out of, canoe, out of a canoe, right? So if our base level of strength isn't high like enough, that. we have no business – rotating right if i can't control myself in the sagittal or frontal plane i've got no business being in the transverse plane until i can nail down those other two so all right so to piggyback off of that right mm -hmm. we all like to think that we're good at sport specific training right. and that's usually you know you have them on a bosu ball and you throw the football back and forth with them or you, you, you tr we're trying to replicate yep. some of the things they're doing you have a lot of big thoughts on this. Can you talk yeah. about what true, what you consider to be sports specific training? Yeah. So sports specific training is probably like, in my opinion, one of the, one of the most misunderstood aspects of training. Um, you know, we learned about it even in school, like exercise science, you learn it needs to be sports specific, you know, athletic training, return to play needs to be sports specific. Well, they never really told us what that means. Right. It's not it's not using the implements of the sport. And so I get it right with a football player. You're having to work on balance and you can incorporate throwing a football that at least he's probably happy like he gets to touch a football. It feels like football. Right. So that's like that's good for buy in. Right. You get him kind of feeling yep. like he's part of the team and he's, you know, doing the, the things that he does on the field. <clears throat> but sports specific training really means more so that's a conditioning thing for me. All right. So what, what do all athletes need? Every single sport. And there's not a sport that doesn't need these things are good base levels of strength for not only like force production, but tissue resiliency, power, speed. And, uh, that's really, I mean, that's pretty much it, right? Those three things. <clears throat> uh, I don't need to make these movements look like the sport as an athletic trainer, as a physical therapist, as you're going through your return to play, right? Your protocols, it's not a bad idea to start applying force at the angles that they'll need on the field of play, but it doesn't need to look like the movements on the field of play. Like for instance, a hockey player, right? Hockey's played in the frontal plane. That's, you know, we move in the sagittal plane, but force vectors are all going out to the side. So if you can have an athlete that's a hockey player and is, you know, early, not early return to play, but like mid return to play, start doing some lateral lunges, right? And we do some lateral lunges. So now we're producing force 
the same force vectors that we're going to need on the ice, but it doesn't look anything like hockey. <clears throat> uh, you know, accelerating, right? So an athlete that's going to have to accelerate on the field of play, you can do a reverse lunge and you can bring it up into a stability position. So stability position <clears throat> is the hip and knee being at 90 degrees, toe pulled up towards your shin. So if you know anything about acceleration mechanics, that's exactly what it looks like. So that top position, bottom leg straight, top legs 90, 90, toe pulled up towards your shin. You do a reverse lunge. As you come up, you're <clears throat> extending through the hip all right. And you're flexing through that opposite hip. All that is, is a movement cue for acceleration. So like think more, you're applying force in the angles that you're going to need on the field of play, as opposed to making it look like the sport. If that makes sense. It does. <laughs> that's, um, that's awesome, dude. So Daniel will probably agree to this as physical therapists. We're very interested in measuring the capacity of muscles to in order to safely return to sports so right. things like the quad index after an acl tear something really basic and easy which someone like you would understand and speak the lingo and we can definitely coordinate care or the quad yeah. hamstring ratio being around three to two you know yeah. um or just seeing the the, the hamstring or I'm sorry, the quad in relation to body weight, all really good metrics for return to sport, return to play right. that we're involved with too. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, so like to, to, to go to that, just kind of off topic, but I am a much bigger fan of a one-to-one -one quad to hamstring ratio. I know like not a lot of people feel that same way, but my athletes that I work with are probably even possibly closer to one and a half, two to one in favor of the hamstrings. Um, for the most part, we do a lot of posterior chain work. That doesn't mean we neglect the quad, mm -hmm. but most of the things that we do on two feet are even done with a vertical to negative shin angle, um, to incorporate the glutes and the hamstrings more. We get our push volume, uh, from dragging and pushing the sled. So that's, that's where the mm. vast majority of that comes from. Doesn't mean we don't do like step ups and we don't do like lunge variations and things like that. It's just that the focus is much more on pulling. And the reason for that is because there are more motor end plate units in the hamstrings than there are in any other uh, muscle group in the entire body, right? So now <clears throat> we want to be powerful. We want to be fast. We have to increase our posterior chain strength, which is going to allow us to deliver more force in the ground and be faster, be more resilient. So Connor, awesome stats there. Where are you getting your information about a quad ham ratio, like an isokinetic machine or uh, handheld so anemometry? It mostly, it, it's mostly like eyeball. <laughs> so I've got a kid that can do, a, you know, like a Nordic hamstring curl, um, like without touching the ground, holding like a 10 or 15 pound dumbbell and he weighs Ball. 175 pounds. Oh, wow. Uh, so I, at that point, I assume that it's stronger. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Very impressive. Well, yeah. So, I mean, we're not, we're not super high tech here. I love the tech. I think there's a ton mm -hmm. of value in it. Um, I just, for me, it just, I don't know that I have the time, um, you know, to deal with it where we got, we got a sure. group of, of 15 kids and I got like an hour and 10 minutes to get them through mm -hmm. eight different movements and a warm up and some, you know, movement prep and all that kind of stuff. So as much as I'd love to be able to test more, you know, I just, I assume. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, hey, you just hit on something that uh, I heard you talk about a lot in your podcast, and that's putting force into the ground, right? Yep. We, you know, usually around week 12 post-op ACL, we start with beginning agilities, you know, and the right. agility ladder is a good place for us to start just to get them used to, you know, pivoting and shifting yep. with that foot. The problem is, is that, you know, six, seven, eight, nine months, there's, we, I see a lot of them still on agility ladders, still on yep. both suits. Can you talk to me about how, you know, why we need to get them away from that and into something that's a little more realistic? Yeah. So I'll tell you what, there are three reasons why agility ladders get used as often as they do. For one, parents love them. Two, they look really good on camera. And three, it makes you tired. So those are why, why they get used so often. Um, so I'm not, I'm not opposed to agility ladders, especially in my, my younger training age athletes who need to develop some coordination and <clears throat> things like that. Like, I don't think there's no place for them. Mm -hmm. I think it, it can be good for a warm up to just change things up. Right. Cause an 80 warm up gets boring sometimes. So if we can have the athletes do like an icky shuffle going down and then we're doing knee hugs or like toe grabs or something on the way back, <clears throat> we're getting them moving around. They're doing something a little bit different like that. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. What I have issue with is how often they get used, right. They're called speed ladders and agility ladders and they increase neither. 
right? It's it's a it's a misnomer for the most part because we're not we're not delivering enough force in the ground. So there's this, uh, it, it's not really a study. It was kind of like, I guess you call it almost like a case study. This guy up in, I believe it was in Chicago. He's a strength coach. He actually used force plates <clears throat> and uh, he did like a 45 degree cut versus an icky shuffle, right? So highest peak output on an icky shuffle versus about a 75% jog to a 45 degree cut. And the 45 degree cut was five times higher, the highest amount of force produced in an icky shuffle. Right. So Connor, what is an icky shuffle? I'm sorry. It's, a, it's an agility oh, ladder movement yeah. where uh, you're on the outside of the agility ladder, okay, okay. right? Like you go left, right. And then the left goes out and then right, left, right goes out. Okay. Left, right, left goes I'll, out. Uh, I'll, if I have time, I'll record myself doing <laughs> one. And I'll throw I it was thinking it was a, like a weird oh. dance move or something. <laughs> All right. Truffle shuffle or something. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'll, I'll find something and throw it up there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's it's it, it doesn't it doesn't move the needle. We're not we're not developing any ground reaction force, to be honest. Uh, so, <clears throat> like, we need to get away from those. And I think for the most part, the field has outside of like you've got a couple guys in the in the industry who, you know, we can talk about this a little bit if you guys are open to it. Like a lot of guys in the industry that shouldn't be um, who don't really understand what they're doing. They either played sports or they look really fit. And all of a sudden now, like there's a sports performance coach, they rarely call themselves strength coaches because I think they understand that they're not. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, it gets used it, dude, you can eat up 20 minutes of a 60 minute session with an agility ladder and you get the kids tired and now they're easy to deal with, you know, like, I mean, sweating. I think yeah. that's one of the reasons they get used so much. Um, <clears throat> but what we should be looking to do is, right, so agility is not how fast your feet move. You guys both know this. Agility is where your hips go, right? So if I'm delivering, if I'm, like, moving my feet really fast and my hips aren't going anywhere, like, there's no there's no time on the field when that happens outside of if you're out of position, right? So the only time my feet move really fast and I don't go anywhere is when I'm way out of position and I have to get my feet in a position, either fall step to accelerate or change direction or something like that, right? So we need to incorporate drills that are going to allow us to develop more force, put more force in the ground and react off of that force, right? So it's not just, you know, it's all kind of demo, but you can't see it obviously, but if I can put force in the ground, right? Did you guys hear that? It was oh, yeah. So I can do that, right? Or I can... I can react off that force Two completely different things. And a lot of times with agility ladders, you see boom, 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 boom. Or you hear coaches say louder, louder. If you're on like a basketball court and you hear the squeaks, they think like the loudness means that like you're putting more force in the ground and you are, but you're not reacting off it. You're just dumping it and leaving it. <clears throat> and so we need to make a more conscious effort to include things like skip variations and bound variations and deceleration drills. Like one of the things I love to do with the younger training age, even the higher training age guys and gals that I work with is we do seven yard sprints and you have two yards to slow down and stop in an athletic base. Right. So <clears throat> drills like that are going to move the needle well beyond what these typical cone drills and, you know, sequence like pre-sequence things that we're doing off the field to play in order to prepare for the field. So and awesome, man. <laughs> so I got a uh, slightly unrelated question. So in, in physical therapy, you know, chronically underloaded um, and just under um, dosed with exercise mm -hmm. for a long, the average physical therapist. So um, any, I guess, any advice for, for therapists on how to do that or, or West, that's where I want to go. I'm sorry. West side barbell. Those guys are incredible. You look at bodybuilders, they have, um, they have figured out how to gain muscle mass in a quick way. And I always thought from a very young age in PT school that there is something to learn from, from these people. And I feel like our field has kind of stuck their nose up at it a little bit, to be honest. But uh, yeah. I feel like we have a, not just something, but a lot to learn from those people. Yeah. Any yeah. thoughts on it? Yeah, man. So like I, in, like as a strength coach, I take, I bite a little bit off of like everybody. Right. And then like develop my own <clears throat> thought processes on how to chase certain adaptations. Right. So bodybuilders have figured out, right. Sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. They have right. High, high volume time under tension with like moderate loads. Well, moderate, they're 
monsters are heavy, but they're moderate for them. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 <clears throat> Spending a lot of time uh, <clears throat> with, with high volume environments is going to be what helps you grow in that respect. Right now we don't want just sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. So I can't just lift like a bodybuilder. What else do I have to do? All right. Well, these guys at West side and these power lifters are ridiculously strong right? I need strength. So like, let's go look at what they're doing. Let's see how they're acquiring this strength and see how I can fit it into my program. And then you've got like work capacity, right? So like world's strongest man, that's like, that's like the biggest misnomer. Strong man is not about strength. It's about work capacity because mm -hmm. <laughs> they're doing these things for incredibly high volume. The guys are monsters and they're strong. Don't get me wrong, but it's about work capacity. So what are these guys doing to increase their work capacity? And how can I apply that to what I do as a coach? And so you just, you go out, you read everything you can. I mean, I, I utilize principles from like the Bulgarian method when training 13 year olds, you know what I mean? It's not, it's not what they did. It's you take what they did and how does this fit it? How can I fit this into what I do with these low training age athletes? And, you know, I, I feel like I figured it out for the most part, but <clears throat> physical therapists, man, like athletic trainers as well, get in there and read, you know what I mean? Like, Read Verkashansky, uh, Sif, Bondarchuk, um, you know, Dietrich Hare, um, read, read, uh, Donald Chu, like he's like the godfather of flying metrics. Like, read from these people and see what they do. And just because you're not working with like world class Olympic athletes doesn't mean that you can't chase those same kind of adaptations that you need to a, a lesser degree in your athletes by utilizing the same principles. So, I mean, you know, like you think about it, I talk about all the time how like we, to be faster, we have to apply more force in the ground and be able to react off that force. Well, if that was the case, the guys at West side would be jumping 30 feet in the air. Right. So it's not, point. it's not just about being strong. It's mm -hmm. about attaining those other qualities as well. Right. Yeah. And I, I personally believe the dynamic effort method does that for us. Um, it, I don't know if, uh, you, have you ever heard of shock training, either of you mm -hmm. two, right. So it was developed mm -hmm. by, I, I think it was uh, Yuri Verkashansky. Uh, because they were in Siberia um, back in the during the Cold War and his sprint athletes couldn't be out on the, the track. So try to figure out what to do. And he's got his guys depth dropping off like five foot boxes. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, so that I mean, that's a bit extreme, but you can scale that down. Right. It doesn't have to be five feet. I mean, I use I do what would be considered depth drop jumps. With like my 10 year olds, we just hop over a six inch hurdle and they hit the ground loaded, right? Mm -hmm. They're just reacting off the ground. It's 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 for all intents and intents and purposes exactly what a depth drop is. It's just not stepping off a 10 foot or a 10 foot, uh 10 inch box, you know. Mm -hmm. You're just barely getting off the ground and you're being a pogo stick jumping up onto the box. So like you can utilize those principles, like scale up and down. Everything mm -hmm. can, you know, strength coaches. I think we figured some of that out back when uh, I'm sure you guys heard of Kelly Sturette. Oh yeah. Right? Kind of damaged the field for a little bit, but he used brought, to have like, his book on my uh, yeah. shelf. Used yeah. to, used to, used to. <laughs> so like, but strength coaches, um, like, so that book that allowed us to have a better understanding of like mobility, mm -hmm. right. And, and tackling like the joint instead of the muscle, you know, and, and a lot of strength coaches took that and created, 45 minute movement prep sessions where we lifted for like 10 minutes, <laughs> mm -hmm. but you know, the parts of it that stayed were great because now even myself, like I get to utilize, I'm not a, a huge fan of the soft tissue stuff prior to lifting. I also find that it tends to leave my athletes substantially more sore if we use it as an active recovery method. Um, so we use it sparingly, uh, but you know, you, you can utilize all those things and physical therapists and athletic trainers have the same access to the other side. They just got to, mm -hmm. I guess be pointed in the right direction, maybe. Yeah. Good point, well, Connor. Thank you so much for coming in and talking yeah. to us tonight. How can Absolutely. people find you? What's your uh, what's your social media? How can we find Lions Den? Yeah, so we're on Instagram, Lions Den Sports Performance. It's just the whole thing. Um, uh, we're on Facebook as well. Uh, our website is uh, www.vldsp as in Lions Den Sports Performance .com. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. I just, we've been busy, man. We haven't been uploading much content to speak of. So, but, uh, but yeah, you can find us out there. Send me an email, Connor at VLDSP.com. Love to talk shop, love to, you know, do anything I can to help people who, you know, who are looking for help and realist, like really want it. So. Awesome. Thank you, yeah. Connor. Absolutely. Man. It was nice to, uh, nice to talk with you guys.
Yeah, I appreciate too, it. <laughs> and uh, we'll see everyone uh, next week on the Everything PT Podcast. Thanks, guys. <laughs>